The way to think differently is to act differently and get comfortable with being uncomfortable. Welcome to the Unlearn Podcast, where host Barry O'Reilly seeks to synthesize the superpowers of extraordinary individuals into actionable strategies you can use to think big, start small, and learn fast, and find your edge with excellence. Here's your host, Barry O'Reilly. Welcome to the Unlearn Podcast. On this episode, I'm delighted to be joined by Kim Arthurton. Now, Kim is the co-founder and CEO of Just Three Things, a startup that is starting to help organizations improve alignment at scale. But before Kim became a startup founder, her background is actually as an occupational psychologist, where she had the chance to work with many leaders and teams to understand how they could create high-performance organizations. She had great opportunities to move to very prestigious and well-known organizations, but she felt it was time for something different, to get uncomfortable. And she found a small startup of 50 people that was focused on clean energy, called Ovo Energy, which you would help to go on to scale to over 2,500 people. And during the course of that experience, she identified a new opportunity the misalignment in organizations, which inspired her to found just three things, which I personally am delighted to be involved with on the board of directors. But before Kim became the startup founder, she was faced with an interesting dilemma and made a decision to take the path less chosen. So it was about 2012 and I was in the final interview stage with a big bank and it was a global head of talent role. And it was one of my clients from when I was an occupational psychologist. And it was on paper, really great career move. So it was a very good, I guess, in terms of cash comp. It was very good in terms of next stage on the ladder. It was quite a senior role, but it just didn't excite me. And I just thought, can I get out of bed every day and be really excited by succession planning for a big bank? (laughs) And then I met an entrepreneur who ran a company called Ovo Energy, which is a green energy tech company here in the UK. And when I first met the founder, there were probably about 50 people and they were literally in a barn. And he said, I want to build the world's best company. And I really need somebody to help me do that. But I want somebody who really is willing to rip up the rule book and really willing to unlearn the way that traditional HR practices have been done. And I just thought, either this guy's crazy or this is going to be an amazing opportunity that won't come along very often. And I had a real belief in the vision of the company because it was green energy and carbon reduction and so forth. So all of my friends and family thought I was crazy because I turned on the big bank and went for this tiny, scrappy startup. And then... Fast forward six years and we're now a unicorn. So 2,000 employees and are in the process of acquiring another large energy company, which will make them the second largest energy provider in the UK. So this is super interesting for me to hear. You know, one of the things, especially when I, the more and more people I interview on this show or have as guests, this idea of the mission and values of the company being way more important to find a great home for yourself than the comp, the prestige of the Fortune 500 brand. It's very interesting to hear that time and time again. And now as you're starting to build your own company, what are some of the key values and missions that you feel are important or you've learned from that time at Ovo as you transcend them into just three things? So I think it's a great question because I think So many people don't place enough emphasis on the importance of mission and vision. And I think it's almost around, it's actually one of your colleagues from your faculty role at university wrote Exponential Organisations. And I read that when I was probably halfway through the over journey and it really resonated. This idea that having a transformative purpose is the thing that really pulls people together and If you think about any walks of life, we know we're doing something for a greater purpose or a greater good. You can put up with a lot more. I've got two children. Nobody would go through pregnancy. It's horrible. (laughs) You know you're doing it for this great purpose. You can put up with so much. 
And I think when you're trying to grow particularly a startup, because the early days of a startup, as we know, have wonderful highs and potential lows. And I think having that belief in that what you're doing is a force for good is the thing that kind of keeps you going through those hard times. Yeah, it's so true. You know, I find this so much in my business as well. Not only the companies that I admire, but the companies I also work best with. When there's a strong alignment between values and behaviors, it just leads to great success on both sides of the equation. You know, I'm a big believer in it's a two way street when you try to find people you're going to work with. And understanding that and finding alignment is so important. Every time I optimize for the big brand or the financial metric, it always goes wrong. (laughs) So I love hearing people who are like living these, identifying these and then allowing them to sort of really go after what matters to them. And I think that's a really powerful step to take. Yeah, I think it's really interesting what you said there around the values and the behaviours aligning, because I think that's so key. And in so many of these bigger corporates, not all by any means, but the values are just words on a piece of paper or words on the wall. And it's actually the behaviours are the things that people look to. I mean, we are just social animals. We think that we're really sophisticated with our mobile phones and our tech, but really our brains haven't evolved that much in millions of years. And so therefore we pick up on behavioural cues almost unconsciously. Amazing. So when was the key time for you when you had to unlearn in your career? So I think the whole OVO journey for me, the whole thing was basically a big lesson in unlearning. I was really lucky in that the founder was very passionate about creating a great place to work. But we also had to be really mindful of the future vision and the way that we needed to be nimble and agile with a big and a small A. And so therefore, we couldn't rely on traditional HR practices. So first of all, I wasn't a HR practitioner. I was a psychologist and I was running the people in HR teams. But secondly, the things I did know about HR, we almost had to unlearn all of them. So to give you some examples, typically organisations would recruit based on somebody's past experience. So you would go into an interview and you'd be asked lots of questions. Tell me about a time when you have X, Y, and Z. And the problem we had was because we knew we were going to have to be so agile and so nimble and potentially change direction quite a few times and pivot, we really couldn't just take people based purely on their experience. So we started interviewing just based on learning agility. So the ability of somebody to unlearn, to be self-aware, to take cues from their environment and to really pivot their approach, essentially. So things like intellectual curiosity is not necessarily something you can teach or train. Absolutely. Uh, Either somebody has it or they don't. So we had to unlearn everything about everything that's been written about how to interview because competency-based interviewing just wasn't going to work for us, as an example. And we had to do that same kind of exercise across how we trained people, how we did succession planning, what our policies look like. Almost everything we had to think, look, there's no point in us having these constrictive kind of policies or individual-based processes when we know that the future of our organisation is going to be a team-based, nimble, agile, living, breathing thing. So again, what's fascinating here is, you know, you're coming from a sort of diverse background anyway into this industry. So that's giving you a different perspective. You know, one of the huge challenges I constantly hear when I'm working with companies is finding the right talent that's aligned to what the company's trying to achieve, mission, vision, values, behaviours. But they all fall down with the classic and they need to have 50 years experience (laughs) in a new technology that just arrived. So it's really interesting to hear how you're thinking about not using a tick box list to find talent, but you're actually thinking about what are these behaviours, values? How do we create processes to find and lift those out of people rather than just look at a flat piece of paper, resume with their 25 years of every project they've worked on, always on time, always on budget, (laughs) no failures, you know? What were some of the challenges like bringing that not only into the company, but to the market as well? Like I imagine agencies are like, we can't source this. What kind of uh, things happened when you started to push back, not only in the company, but I guess the ecosystem around the company? Yeah, it's a great question. So we actually took this approach in hiring at all levels. So from 
MDs and C-suite, all the way through to customer service agents. We took the same type of approach. So we did have certain criteria. So there are definitely things that probably correlate to, let's take intellectual curiosity, for example. So yeah. if somebody has done a broad level of subjects at school, if they've got a degree, not necessarily a surefire way of indicating intellectual curiosity, because there might be a hundred reasons why they didn't go to university, but they might list reading or as their hobby. So there are some indicators that you can look for in a CV. What we didn't look for is, as you say, the I did this project or I did this program. So to give you an example for software engineers, even in my current company, so Just Three Things, we don't look for specific languages. So we just look for people who have learning agility, so they're bright, they're flexible, they're curious, they're self-aware, they're a team player, all that, that type of stuff. And essentially, they have an aptitude for programming or developing in some way. And then we can always upskill them. We can always pair them, we can always develop them, and but you can't train for the rest of that stuff. Yeah, it's interesting to hear that because, again, it's a huge challenge for people. So that's one example you said of like, trying to even shake up human resources as an entity in the ecosystems of companies. What other sort of interesting things came out of your experience as you were trying to grow this company? So in terms of growing over, I think we made a lot of mistakes, by the way. So it wasn't, it wasn't really? a mistake. Uh, you made mistakes? <laughs> Specifically thinking about, again, unlearning. I think as we started to grow and we started to, I guess, put together a senior team and we really had to work with that team to unlearn some of the behaviours that potentially, I guess, it come from working in bigger corporates. So we really couldn't afford to be non-transparent, for example. We had to have full transparency over the strategy, over the mistakes, over everything. And of course, that's for all the reasons we know and love. So you know, we wanted to create an environment of psychological safety. We wanted to empower our teams to test and learn and to have hypothesis-led learning. But we could only really do that with full transparency. And that was really scary for our senior team. And they had to go through an unlearning process to talk about, you know, you might not have the perfect baseline measure, but that doesn't mean we can't, shouldn't still set an outcome around it. So that was, I guess, certainly something we went through together. The importance of communication, I think when the train is just hurtling down the track at that speed and we were growing so quickly, I mean, I'm a psychologist, so I knew this, but I didn't really know it. I remember studying that when people are in a state of change, the fight or flight areas of the brain, the amygdala and so forth, process information 10,000 times more quickly than your more logical frontal cortex. And so if things are changing around you, you need any logical messages to come through many, many, many more times than you would do if you weren't in that state of fight or flight. But when we were living through the OVO journey, just really appreciating that, the number of times we needed to reiterate the vision mission, the number of embedding activities that we had to do around the values. And it, it's even easy to forget. You think I've communicated the strategy this year, surely that will do. But that constant reiteration of why we're here, why we're here for a purpose bigger than ourselves. And, and that was just so important. It's really, again, funny when I hear this, because I see so many of these challenges with a lot of businesses as they're starting to grow, right? The things that made them successful when they're 50 yes. people to 100 people to 500 people are fundamentally often very, very different. And especially when you're bringing people in from different companies that maybe had more bureaucracy or less transparency, and then asking people to sort of adopt those behaviors that are being successful in your company to grow it is really, really interesting. One of my most interesting case studies we did with Capital One Bank is when they did their cloud adoption, they built a tool specifically to describe what outcome-based measures of success, like certain percentage of their infrastructure in the cloud. And then they plotted this on a graph for all the different teams in the company and made it visible to everybody exactly where they were relative to the outcomes they were aiming for for each team. Now, I made it fully transparent in the company. Now, when I tell people that, most people start panicking, going, well, what if I'm the slow team? What yes. if I'm 
the team that's down in the bottom corner of the diagram. How am I going to be treated? And we're so conditioned to these ideas of paid for performance, bell curving and yes. grading of how people will be paid. And yet the research shows that paid for performance actually doesn't work. It's actually the problem, not the solution. So I think when you're trying to introduce some of these concepts into these companies that you have already scaled and obviously the company you're growing at the moment, how do people react sometimes? I'm curious, like, because you're sort of teaching them learning by doing. So they do need to have learning agility, whether they've worked in a company that wants to be that transparent or not. It's probably a little uncomfortable. Yeah, no, for sure. So I couldn't agree more. I really couldn't agree more in terms of the performance related pay. I go to HR conferences still and the majority of organisations still reward people this way. And it's just so detrimental. It really undermines everything they're trying to do with culture change or transformation. And they say, I don't understand why we're not creating this cohesive, collaborative type work environment when you're pitting one person against the other when it comes to bonus time. Yeah. We want to be a high performance team and we're going to bonus everyone individually. Yes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. But yet I think it is quite scary for people because they are so used to the norms in the Western world around these things. So in even my software engineer team at Just We Things, so I took away performance bonus. We had a bonus, but it was a team-based bonus. And I said, Do you know what, guys, you can't use this for your mortgages anyway. I believe it doesn't motivate even at a team level. I'd like to take it away. But it's essentially, we're a small team, so it's up to you guys. You know, why don't you go and have a chat, go and have a pint, and have a think about whether what, what would work for you. And it was quite interesting. They kind of came back and they were really like, oh, but, you know, this isn't how we strange for our CV and this isn't how we you things you normally done. And we were offering, obviously, a small incremental pay increase in exchange for. And it was really interesting, even though they bought into all the reasons, the norms of society were still really strong, that this isn't the way it's done. Yeah, so interesting, right? The thought works is exactly the same. You know, when I joined, there was like, there's no bonus. Just you figure out, well, like, what do you want to be paid to do this job? And that's what we'll pay you. You know, and it was interesting. You know, because that was one of the first companies where I'd gone in and there was like, first of all, there was no managers. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah, no, that was like, okay. So who runs the asylum? Oh, great, we do. Okay, that's good. You know, and no bonus thing. And a lot of these things were like really inspiring for me because mm. I think when you're living these sort of, I would believe them as progressive ways to run companies, like you're not just sort of talking about them as, oh, there's a better way to do it, but you're actually living, breathing, experimenting and actually going to your teams to say, what would be best for you? We want to measure by team because we think that's success. How do you think we could get there? I think that's really powerful. And not a lot of management teams or founders want to do that. They often want to tell them why it's important, uh, what success is, and exactly how they're going to do it, and then inflict it onto the teams. So power to you for pulling that information from them. Well, it's also maybe it's lazy leadership. <laughs> you, <laughs> you can set the vision and then say, well, guys, yeah, this, is, we've got to, this is where we need to get to. How are we going to do it? Help me out here. Interesting about the ThoughtWorks. I didn't realise that there was no bonus there. Do they salary band? Do you have over time? Yeah. So people. So this was again an interesting jive, right? Because people were widget makers. Mm -hmm. Then everyone wanted to be a senior widget maker. Then we needed more widgets. No, so <laughs> senior wasn't enough. And then we had to have a lead, and then write to a principal, and and now there's directorships there, which chief we, widget maker. Exactly. You know, and I think. Often, then when you have bandings, then there's this laddering effect where people were like, well, I should be a senior widget maker now. And a lot of time and energy would be put into, well, how do I become a senior widget maker? You know, and to contrast that then with other companies like Netflix, where everyone's just a senior engineer. There's no CTO. There's just senior engineers. And you can be a senior widget maker if you want. And off you go. You just go do some engineering. And again, it's very, very interesting when I think these companies sort of really like attack the classic norms or perceived this is the way things are done type approaches to not only designing their companies, but running their companies. And invariably, no matter who I spend time and talk with, the highest performing organizations are always ones that figure out what's best for them. 
they don't take the copy and place blueprint or framework and it looks busy that you're doing stuff, but it's not really, I think, leading organizations and it certainly doesn't allow them to experiment to find the right practices for their context to be successful. No, I completely agree. And I think the key thing in what you said there is around experimentation and having the feedback loop, because I think let's take, for example, the trend in HR to talent or people or whatever function we want to call ourselves to do away with policies. So you have the classic Netflix, we're not going to have an expenses policy, hire fully formed adults, all of that kind of trend. And that's great if your culture supports that. But we experimented at OVO with taking away holiday policies, so number of days holiday a year. So we experimented with taking away holiday allowance just with a small part of the company. And essentially, it was one of those things that I probably did because it was trendy. And actually, it was the wrong thing to do because we ended up with people essentially taking personality-based holiday allowances. So the people who were perhaps a little bit more diligent or slightly neurotic wouldn't take any holiday at all. And then the people who were a bit more laid back and a bit more self-confident would just take loads of holiday. And so it just didn't work. So I think in what you said, I couldn't agree more in terms of always pushing the envelope and thinking about how better to run a company. But I think the really important thing is not learning that some things are going to work and some things aren't and not just doing them because they're cool. So there's some real great takeaways for me here. First of all, I love your pattern for experimenting. So thinking big, like getting rid of all holidays, but actually starting small and just picking a small group to run a test or prototype with. I think that allows good experimentation and learning fast to happen. So I love hearing examples of that. The detail of your story, though, that the propensity of people to take holidays based on their, I guess, themselves. I see this so much, right? Lots of my friends and camaraderies are in these companies who allow as much leave as you want. And I know the characters that are like disappearing all the time. And yet they also talk a lot about this pressure to not take holidays because you don't want to be seen the one to let the team down. Yeah. Or in companies, for instance, where they're measured on their impact individually, they need to have other people to say that they were there. So they're afraid to take time. So who's winning here? You know, and our customers winning. Are the individuals winning? Is the company winning? Because it sounds great to say, oh, we've as much leave as you want to take. It's like Hotel California, though, like no one ever leaves. <laughs> so, um, it's so but true. I do appreciate this idea of just because something sounds cool. You know, I think it's important to try these things. But I think doing it, thinking big and starting small and then being honest and candid about what's working about it and what you saw, I think is super powerful for people. Yeah, fab. I think, again, we're all just social animals. We want guardrails. We don't want to have no rules at all. We want to be able to push against them, of course, but we need a sandbox. Otherwise, it's really hard to do your job effectively. Absolutely. So building on top of that then, so these are some great personal experiences you've had trying to shake up the HR industry. So first of all, thank you for that. Moving on to like the companies that you've worked in, like where are some of the patterns maybe you saw where companies had to unlearn as they tackled more and more of these sort of interesting challenges? So I think at, certainly at OVO, we were unlearning all the time and actually just three things. I mean, goodness. So we're building a product every time we go and talk to a new client or a potential client. We have some of our assumptions challenged and we have to take it back to the drawing board and Start lots of life, fun. Huh? Yeah, lots of fun. We've got this figured out until we talk to a customer. <laughs> but I think when we were at OVO, so some of the things, so we were moving, for example, from monolithic tech to microservice, and we were kind of figuring that out as we went. So the CTO at OVO is a incredibly bright, incredibly real talent proper learning agilities. But when we went through that change, I think he was 31 and he was kind of leading. Yeah, he'd worked in high performance organizations before, but he'd never really led one. And likewise, I think I'd read your book 
and I'd read a couple of others. And, Thank you very much. And, uh, and we were like, right, off we go. And but in a way, that kind of gave us an advantage because we weren't unlearning. And yet lots of our colleagues were unlearning. So taking the senior leadership team with us on that journey was a whole exercise in helping them to unlearn perhaps the way that traditional leadership had been done and really looking at how to move things into the next century. So I'm really interested on some of your sort of anecdotes from trying that, you know, because one of the things, especially with exec camp, is I'm purposely getting executives to like leave their company with the goal to launch new businesses to disrupt their existing business. But the real point is to disrupt themselves. And this idea of being comfortable with being uncomfortable, trying new behaviors, learning by doing, like deliberately practicing, getting outside your comfort zone. So what were some of the fun stories that happened as you were working with this leadership team? And I'm sure yourself as you were trying to scale the company and as you continue to scale the current business. Yeah, I mean, lots of probably ones I can't repeat. Let me give you an example from Ovo. So I remember we were talking about transparency and the concept of distributing decision making through the organisation. So when we did the all company, all hands meeting, big town hall, and we talked about moving, the analogy both worked for our monolithic tech move to microservice, but also moving to business units. So we talked about moving from being a tankard, even though we were only 2,000 people, to a flotilla of ships, able to kind of navigate the empowered, to navigate the waves. Everyone's like, yes, we love this concept. Everyone was really, really excited about it. And we did lots of, so the CTO and I read the books, then we got in loads of agile coaches, and then we did some great stuff on mindset. And we thought, this is going to be awesome. Yeah, people are going to just love this. We're going to deliver loads of amazing tech, and we're going to create this amazing place to work. It's going to be awesome. And it just didn't really work. (laughs) And employee satisfaction actually really, really tanked. Yeah. Because we really thought that people wanted to be master of their own destiny on their small ship, part of this flotilla, and that they would give them loads of career opportunities to be on other ships and and give them master of their own destiny. And actually what it led to was just confusion because we took away a whole load of more traditional processes and we didn't replace them with any guardrails or any new ones. So even really, really basic stuff. So before this move, we were structured into functional hierarchies and we, there was an org chart on the HR system. So I could go in, I could say, right, who is Barry O'Reilly? Right, I can see who he is and who reports into him and who his manager is. And yet in this new world, we were working in cross-functional networks of teams. And Nobody knew who was in which team. It sounds really simple, but there was no way of people finding out who belonged to which cross-functional team, how those laddered up. And so there was constant debates about recruitment and which teams were most needed the most people. And then there was, what are these teams working on? And we had, essentially, obviously we were using Jira, other products are available, and Essentially, we had the senior team sitting there trying to look at JIRA boards and just feeling so out of their depth, feeling so psychologically uncomfortable. And we talk about creating an environment of psychological safety for the people delivering the work. It's also, we've got to do that for our senior leaders too. If you all of a sudden you expect them to understand this whole new vocabulary, these whole new ways of working, and use all these, use JIRA, which is quite hard to understand and it was just kind of chaos so they were asking for end of week reports and start of week packs and all of our team leads they were just endlessly reporting essentially and this kind of confusion piece is how we essentially built just three things because we really wanted to solve this problem and yet we couldn't find there were lots of goal setting tools on the market but none that were really optimised for this kind of cross-functional way of working. So most of the goal setting or OKR setting software was very hierarchical. So you took your key results from your boss's objective, essentially. Or took your objective from your boss's key results. So we couldn't find anything. So we hired a UX designer and he sat with me in HR. And we spent probably six months talking to people and saying, why is employee satisfaction going down? what is it? And what came back was, you know, confusion, not understanding the landscape, real confusion over who was working on what, 
reinventing the wheel everywhere, all over the company. People not feeling that they were contributing to the vision because they didn't understand how they fitted in. And so essentially, we built just a really simple, really transparent tool where all of the teams could set up who they were, what they were working on, which customer outcomes they were working on, and then link those outcomes to the strategy and then link their day-to-day to the outcomes. So you had a kind of golden thread. When we first released that, it was very skinny MVP and it was called Cadence. It's a good name, actually. I liked it. Yeah, yeah. I did like it. Unfortunately, it was a little bit more kind of like cyclical with no end, kind of, yeah. But the reason we transitioned it to just three things was because we then started realizing that even though we were this flotilla of ships, in theory, and even though two ships could be working on two different things or two different outcomes, it was still hugely beneficial for the ships to understand what was the most important things to the senior team. And so we started writing some of the key kind of outcomes or initiatives onto cards and blue tacking them to the CEO's door. And we started doing that in stack ranked order. And again, senior team were like, why? I don't understand. Acquiring this company has nothing to do with launching broadband. Why do you have to stack rank them? And our point was, if you want to distribute decision making, everyone has to have the same context. You have to have complete clarity over the current priorities. And so people used to file past the door to look at the company priorities. And so we built that then into what was Cadence in the idea that everyone from the senior team all the way through to squads or the composite part teams all listed out their top three priorities at any one time. And so that everybody had complete clarity about whether their priorities aligned to the strategic priorities, for example. And we could communicate that all in one go. Yeah, so what's fabulous about this story is, first of all, you've described a problem that I see all the time. These companies go on these huge transformations and it spins up lots of activity. You know, there's training courses that people are running on. There's coaches running around and telling people exactly what they need to be doing because the rule book says to do it X, Y and Z. And it creates loads of activity. But does it create context and help people understand? And I think that's a huge challenge. I think while so many of the transformations we hear about in the market fail, is it sort of just inflicted onto people. There's a huge amount of change happening. So there are no guardrails. It's uncomfortable and over uncertain for people. And that leads to difficult situations. I think, again, thinking big and starting small and evolving your organization by introducing small things and experimenting what works and what doesn't is super powerful, you know, and to recognize that with this system you started to build and even better, a manual system to begin with of capturing and making it visible to people what are the mission, the outcomes, the things people are focused on, putting it somewhere so visible and poignant outside your CEO's office where people could see. It's like the concierge MVP. It's like here (laughs) is like we're manually solving this problem and it's working for us. And I think this is one thing so many entrepreneurs miss is software is just an automation of a manual process. It just allows you to do things faster, scalar with robots, just processing it. But if they don't have a system that actually works, you're automating a bad process. So this idea of doing it manually and learning what works and what doesn't work manually, you're close to your customers and eventually turning that into a product. I think it's a masterstroke move. So how did you start to really sense that this was something then that you were like, the next step here is we need to turn this into something we're using. And now here we are down the road and you've built a whole new company around this. So. What were some of the aha moments where you said, right, there's there's something more than just five cards outside the CEO's office here? Yeah. So I think when we built this, by the way, when we first built it, we built it in SharePoint oh, <laughs> and we chucked it away, obviously. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah it, was, I just it was so bad. Stuff goes to die in SharePoint. <laughs> this is the first thing that has ever come out of SharePoint and is still alive. Saying, that's it's, amazing. Yeah, it was terrible. It was because, well, because I was a psychologist, the UX process, I had a deep sympathy for because there's lots of psychology in that and that was kind of my background. 
when it came to developing it, I kind of basically borrowed some time from some of the devs. But the only ones I could get hold of were people that were looking at the internal processes, because obviously I was HR. Yeah. And so I was like, can I just grab an hour here, an hour there? Anyway, it was awful. It was so bad. But we proved the concept in that they just wanted the information they needed when they needed it. Instead of relying on you know, a town hall style communication or an intranet, which was just busy and full, they wanted to, to know, again, this idea of employee engagement. People think it's all about free food. and But actually, most of us, think we just want to know that what we're doing is important, that it's making a difference to ideally a vision or a mission we believe in. And that we can make sense of the chaos. We can put our guardrails back into place because we know who is in which team and how it all adds up. And just things like the endless reporting. I mean, that was such a painful, it was almost like a cottage industry. Oh, absolutely, um, yeah. Uh, yeah, these kind of end of week reports and, and every greatest respect to all senior leaders, everyone wants it done in their way. So I want a slide deck and I want to excel and there's no uniformity to it. There's no history. There was no feedback loops or way of creating a learning organization. So putting this into place, even the really basic rubbish version, helped us to just calm the noise a little bit. And that's all we were looking to do. I mean, I was very much focused on scaling OVO. We weren't even considering this as an external project. But it did make a difference for OVO. In particular, our kind of team leads estimated that it saved them three hours a week. And that was in lost productivity from all the endless reporting. Well, that's huge. That's like 10% of their time. Yes. That's massive. Yeah, no, absolutely. And and also just the, I don't know, soul-destroying nature of just reporting all the time when you want to be doing. Absolutely. Um, so we had a big increase in productivity and an increase in employee satisfaction. So We went from 52nd to 20th in the Sunday Times, best places to work. Not obviously not all because of just three things, but some of the questions like, I understand the part I play in this organisation. I feel like I have trust in the senior team. Those types of questions went up. Again, just the transparency of it all. So in 2017, I was talking at a conference and I basically hadn't prepared a topic and it got to kind of a couple of the slides were due in basically like the next day. And I thought, do you know what? I could just do a demo of this tool. And the topic was innovation in HR. And I thought I could just do a demo of this tool and I don't have to do slides. And you know. and so essentially I did. And I had people coming up and asking, what is this? We are also going through similar. It was typically you're moving from siloed hierarchy to cross-functional working, whether that be projects or agile with a big A or but that type of transformation was typically their pain point. Yeah, lots of people were saying, could we get our hands on this? And I thought, okay, well, maybe there's something in this. And then I entered it, same HR conference, entered it into a digital innovation award. We didn't win the NHS one, which is awesome. That is good. Exactly. It's really good. But the judge called me afterwards and said, you really should consider this as a separate business um, because there's nothing else like it on the market, essentially. And at that point, the seeds were already there. Um, right. But that really kind of cemented it. And then we separated off the infrastructure and we gave it to some friendly companies. So some really lovely beta partners. So NHS was a beta partner, Veolia, the waste management people, lots of different kind of use cases. But essentially what we were looking to prove out was, you know, the onboarding experience is going to be absolutely appalling because this is an already formed product. The user management is going to be terrible. But does the product work for the end user? And essentially, the feedback was really positive. And in fact, some of these are still our clients now. And so in 2018, we launched as a separate business. And now we're working with a whole range of organizations. So Deloitte, Fidelity, the NHS, Go Compare, lots of different use cases. But the similar ethos in terms of we want to bring transparency, we want to bring focus on customer outcomes, not just endless doing stuff. And we want to make sure that we're empowering people and teams. Yeah, it's great insights. And thank you for being so open about them. You know, I think a huge takeaway for me is there's so many things people do to try and create this great culture of their company. Football tables, foosball tables, ping pong, free lunch, free holidays. But the real nub of this idea that when people understand how their effort is aligning, 
to the outcomes and impact ultimately on their customers. That's the key. Yeah. If you can create that for people, like that's an unending tap of motivation and experimentation. So I think it's fabulous to hear that. Yeah. And I love the way you've built out the business as well by starting with paper cards to doing a demo because I couldn't find any slides. <laughs> awesome. And listening to the market, right? Listening to people say, this is, we need something like this. This is interesting. How do we start to double down on it? So fabulous to hear you doing all this stuff. Uh, obviously excited to see what the future lays ahead for you. So you. what does the future lie ahead? <laughs> so I think I've always considered myself really lucky in my career. I've always found what I do really fascinating. And when I first started as a psychologist, what I found really, really fascinating was getting to interview individuals. So I was typically doing senior level, either assessments or development coaching type things. And I got to ask people really personal questions. I got to try to understand what made them tick. And I think what I'm really excited about right now is almost getting to do that again, but at the organisational level. So I'm, again, feel so lucky that what I'm doing with Just Three Things is going into completely different organisations and by the process of working through, let's put on your strategic aims, let's think about the mission, let's think about how your teams are aligned, are they mission aligned, getting under the skin of the, almost the kind of the actual system rather than the individual. And it's just fascinating. So I feel very lucky to be able to do that. And I'm excited about doing much more of that in the future. And of course, the Just Three Things story the Ovo scaling was so much fun, but I didn't do the early stage with Ovo. I came in at 50 and went through 50 to 2000. And with Just Three Things, we are pre-50 employees at the moment. And so seeing that early stage as well is, again, a really, really interesting learning experience. And almost when we get to scale, I'll feel really comfortable then because I've done that before. Not, of course, and made a million mistakes and probably make a million more. But this early stage is brand new, which is, so it's really fun. Well, I'm excited to see what happens and I'm definitely sure we'll have you back on the show again to share that experience. You know, so many people only get to maybe scale a company and yet you're always challenging yourself and they're trying to build a company and go back through that process and unlearn and relearn. And <laughs> so it's really inspirational to hear what you're doing. And thank you very much for coming on to the show to share your stories. And I look forward to 